My name is Yasser Al Syed. I'm the director of maternal fetal medicine and obstetrics here at Stanford. Uh, we've had a uh, wonderful morning so far with uh, three fascinating lectures by Dr. Zernika Getz, uh, Para, and Bear, uh, and an inspirational and powerful keynote uh, lecture uh, by Dr. Liu. We continue with uh, four remarkable uh, presentations coming up. Uh, the first is by Dr. Gary Shaw. He is a professor uh, and associate chair of pediatrics here at Stanford, a renowned perinatal epidemiologist uh, who has done really sentinel work on uh, gene environment interactions and birth defects. Uh, his uh, talk today is on the common, costly, and complex nature of birth defects and preterm birth. Uh, please welcome Dr. Gary Shaw. Thank you, sir. Uh, welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in front of you. Um, I, I share the uh, plight of the previous speakers. The lights are just, you have to get used to them. Um, uh, thank you, Yasser. As, he, as Yasser's just pointed out, I'm going to be talking about four areas uh, that relate to birth defects and to preterm birth. A little bit of background, very little bit of background. Uh, birth defects are not one disease. There are many diseases with many etiologies, even though I'm going to group them in my discussion, essentially, as birth defects. And when I say that, I, I truly mean that every organ system of the body is affected by a birth defect. And each of these has a different etiology. Spina bifida is different from Down syndrome different from various ear anomalies that we observe in the newborn period, different from eye anomalies. And I'm only, I only have a few more pictures of these, so for those of you who are light of heart and don't really want to see this, or different from hydrocephaly. This particular birth defect, gastroschisis, where the abdominal contents are, when the child's born, are outside the body, uh, is a fascinating birth defect. It's one of the few birth defects that has been increasing over the last two decades around the world, and no one seems to know why. Cleft lip and cleft palate. I'll be talking about this one in just a few minutes in more detail. Preterm birth is also a heterogeneous outcome. We typically define preterm birth as less than 37 weeks gestation, but it's not one, it, it's not one disease phenotype. Preterm birth that uh, when babies are born too soon, when they're born, let's say, at 25 weeks, that's probably very different in the etiology than when they're born at 36 weeks. It's certainly very different in terms of what their, their prognosis will be. So let me launch into my common, costly, critical, and complex diatribe. So from, a common, from the common standpoint, birth defects, think one in 33 births. That's in, this, in, the, in the US. Every three minutes in the US, a baby's born with a structural birth defect. Let's contrast that with, with preterm birth. Think one in 10 births is born too soon. It's double that in African-American babies. So think about what our previous speaker just spoke, spoke about in terms of e uh, equality in this country. One baby every minute is born preterm in the US. Costly. Birth defects in a single year based on a 2004 CDC estimate are in the, the this is just hospital costs, not lifelong costs or anything else, 2.6 billion. Multiply that by 10 and that's the approximate annual cost, medical costs for preterm birth. So I'm going fast on these areas, but I'm gonna slow down a little bit when we talk about critical and I'm gonna really slow down when I talk about the complexity of these. In terms of birth defects, they are the leading cause of infant mortality. Remember what Michael Lou said, this country has one of the highest infant mortality rates in the, in, in the world. One in five of all infant deaths are due to a structural malformation in the United States. This, there, there are just innumerable lifetime uh, disabilities and morbidities associated with this group we, that I'm referring to as birth defects. The critical nature of preterm birth. 
It's absolutely the leading cause of long-term neurological disabilities. And babies born too soon, even just a few weeks too soon, face serious risk of death or health problems, such as life-threatening infections, learning disabilities, and behavioral problems later in life. You'll hear more about some of that later in this, this symposium. Let's talk a little bit about complex. So, as our discovery tools get better, and they are getting better, we either have to shrink the size of the haystack, or we've got to magnify the size of the needle in the haystack. Right now, we know that there's essentially 75% of birth defects are unexplained. We just don't know what the cause is. For preterm birth, it's probably about 50%. That's, to me, that's not acceptable. There's a publication that, uh, in about 1988 that, that sort of is a pie chart, describes the, this sort of unknown fraction of birth defects. It has, we have not moved that needle. That pie chart really hasn't changed. Some of you may have heard about folic acid and how we've prevented spina bifida and, and other neural tube defects. Well, it's made a difference, but it hasn't, we haven't made that big a difference, even with something as, as heralded as the, the preventive medicine's uh, big score in the last 20 years. We need to do more. As someone who's done, uh, as Yasser introduced me, I've, I've been doing epidemiologic studies for several decades. And I've, in, in doing these studies, I've had the privilege to speak to many parents who have had either birth effects or preterm birth. And it goes something like this. Mother calls me on the phone and says, I'd be happy to participate in your study, but can you tell me, I don't understand why I had a, I had a child with a birth defect. I took folic acid, I'm college educated, I make $200,000 a year, I'm making that up. But, um, but I'm, I'm wealthy enough that eating right, I don't drink alcohol, I didn't drink alcohol in the early gestation, I don't smoke cigarettes. Why? So that is, right now we don't have many answers um, to, to provide to a, a family that suffered this kind of uh, condition. What we do know is in this whole unknown fraction, whether it be birth defects or preterm birth or a variety of complex diseases that we've yet to really discover what's going on, is it's, it's a complex interplay between the host genome, the environmental context a particular person lives in, and the lifestyle choices they make. So the way these can come together, these kinds of interactions, is as follows. It could be a gene by gene kind of interaction. It could be gene and lifestyle. I mean, you, you can keep going. Gene and gene and lifestyle, gene and gene, lifestyle and environment and environment and environment. All of these, this is how it's all gonna come together. And when people start talking about precision health or precision public health, these are the kinds of ways we're gonna have to start thinking about in terms of what causes what. And the only way we're gonna prevent something is to be able to identify what causes what. So people talk about gene environment interactions and their various forms a lot, but I can honestly say there are very few really good examples in the scientific literature where it's been demonstrated in population science. Coming back, this is my last, my last uh, hardcore picture uh, for, for those that don't like seeing this. Cleft lip and cleft palate, we strongly believe is caused by cigarette smoking in early gestation. But it's, it, it's, it's odd the way, the way it actually presents because the, the risk is only about 50% elevated. And when we think about causes, we tend to think that it's two or 300 or 400 or even a thousand percent increased in risk. So a 50% increase in risk makes us pause a little bit. We think maybe we've missed something, maybe we don't quite have it right. So the way to think about this is what is it about P53 
people who smoke, that, that not all of them get, have an elevated risk. And those who do smoke and have this elevated risk, what is it about them? So you have to sort out all those different combinations of profile based on context, based on environment. So here's, here's some, I, I think the cigarette industry was quite prescient when they, when they chose Joe Camel as one of their branding marks, because it, to me it looks like Joe Camel has a cleft lip and cleft palate. Um, okay, that's my only political one too. Uh, so let me, let me walk you through sort of biologically how we start thinking about these things sometimes. So we have this enzyme pathway called nitric oxide synthase. There are a number of gene variants in this pathway that allow us to metabolize uh, exposures such as cigarette smoke. So we, we came along and we said, all right, so we know about this. So let's start thinking about that in context with cleft lip and cleft palate. So we asked the question, um, and I'm going to get to it, but we know that smoking compromises this particular pathway. We also know that certain gene variants influence, and that is raise, homocysteine concentrations. Well, homocysteine is important because homocysteine is part of the whole folic acid story, and folic acid, we think, may be associated with reducing the risk of, cle of cleft lip and cleft palate. So we, we, we put all of this together, and we ask ourselves the question, is clefting risk from these nitric oxide synthase variants modified by smoking and further modified by vitamin intake? So think about assembling large populations to be able to tease out all the different combinations that are going to be sitting in here. So we did that. I want to direct your eyes to the very bottom row of the table that I'm showing you. So the referent group, so the group of women out there in pregnancy that have this wild type or the quote unquote normal genotype, what we're looking for is to, to have a comparator. The comparator is, is these, this group of women. So these wild type women with, that doesn't sound good, does it? That don't, that, that, that don't smoke. <laughs> But do take vitamin U, that, but do take vitamins are our comparator. Who is, the, who, who would we hypothesize would be the most at risk? Well, that's the top line or the top row in this particular graphic. And that is those that have the variant, so they have less ability to, to sort of tolerate uh, smoking exposure, who smoke and, and don't take vitamins. So they've got all the factors going against them. And indeed, there is the five-fold risk that we would be, or the 500% that we'd be looking for in kind of a causal pathway. So this is where we're going to have to go to get to precision public health or precision health. We have to do these kinds of deep dives, and, and essentially they've got to be biologically driven and, and sort of start showing us causes. So this is part of defining the haystack smaller or or making the needle more prominent. Let me turn to preterm birth for a few minutes. So preterm birth is also a complex set of phenotypes, as I, as I said a few minutes ago. Some have even talked, have, have laid the term intractable onto preterm birth. Well, we, we tend to disagree here at Stanford. Uh, Four years ago, Stanford uh, was, was awarded um, by very wise people at uh, the March of Dimes and the March of Dimes board, who includes Harvey Cohen, um, to, to, to start us on a path using team science. So Michael Liu talked about transdisciplinary uh, kinds of work. Well, that's what we've done here. We've created a center called the March of Dimes Prematurity Research Center at Stanford. And we've started to really look at the complexity of preterm birth in a transdisciplinary way. So there are many scientific areas that are involved. This is led by David Stevenson. Um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, we have Wednesday, uh, Wednesday preterm meetings. Anybody's welcome to come. We have great discussions. We're on it. 
It is a complex problem. It's going to require multiple approaches. The way we're approaching it in the center is think from the surface of a single cell to the population writ large. So there are many different carvings that can go in between those two uh, ends of the spectrum. That's, that's the approach. It's going, to take all of, it's going to take all of us and all of, all of the ways that one can look at it to sort of understand what's going on. So far, we have a few good leads. And I'm going to present a few of those. I'm not going to get into major detail. I'm just going to present a few of them. So birth spacing. So the time between one delivery and the next conception. This is my family. <laughs> no. I mean, can you imagine? Um, the daycare costs alone. The, so. When that time interval is short, the risk doubles or more. So when it's short, like in less than six months. So this is, an, this is a, a, a particular area that we could actually intervene on. And we're, we're starting to do that. We're talking to our OB colleagues and trying to put this into play. And, and, and hopefully, if we could extend that period, the, the risk may go away. We don't quite understand what's driving the risk. It may be a nutritional depletion syndrome. We're not sure. I mean, we know that in the, in the uh, global space that that's, that's probably true. In the US, we're not so sure. So it's still an area, active area of research. So we all know, I, mean, I, don't, I don't need to tell any audience that obesity is a problem in this country. Obesity is a problem for a variety of reproductive outcomes too. And preterm birth is one of them, particularly early preterm birth. So babies that are born in the period less than 31 weeks are anywhere from two to four-fold uh, elevated um, if, the, if the mom was obese in the pre-pregnant -preg, pre state. And the more obese, the more the risk. So we've asked the question, what's sitting behind this? And one of the ways that, that we've done this is to, to try to understand inflammation. So we do know that obesity is a complex phenomenon. It's clearly related to nutrition, whether that's over or under nutrition. Uh, we think that, there's, that the obese um, phenotype is one of chronic inflammation. So we went after this to see if inflammation was actually mediating the association. And the next speaker is going to uh, basically dig deep, not into the obesity story, but into the Im immunologic story. And it's a fascinating one. So if I've put you to sleep, wake up for his talk. Um, so here's what we did. We, we, we took a look at serum levels in the mid-pregnancy uh, time period, so before, before the preterm birth occurred, and we only looked among obese women. And what we were looking for was an immune profile signature that might differ among obese women versus obese women between preterm and term. And we've, so far, this is a pilot study, and we have seen some very interesting things. These particular cytokines were either decreased or increased in these serum specimens. Another area that we've been exploring, particularly in the, uh, the lovely region and air quality region of Fresno and, and the rest of the Central Valley here in California, uh, has been air pollution. Air pollutants also create chronic inflammation. So that is, that is sort of the, the theme that we seem to be constantly uh, observing. And when we've looked, what we've seen so far is that exposures in, that are elevated seem to be at, are putting some women at anywhere from two to three to even four-fold increased risks for having babies too soon. So this is an active area of research. We're trying to understand that. That's going to take more and more digging to see what is it about certain people who are exposed to certain pollutants in the air that are at increased risk. So that's the common, that's the costly, that's the critical, that's the complex. 
The complex part, I'm very fortunate to be a faculty member here at Stanford. It's, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. It's wonderful to be working in a, in a transdisciplinary center, trying to understand in novel ways what's going on with, with babies being born too soon. At the same time, it's like herding cats. So you have, you, it's great to be in a transdisciplinary sp space, but you're trying to get people to do things all the time. We've been studied by the social scientists. So this is like on steroids. This is like a, this is a sort of a network diagram of how everybody interacts. Some of you may see your names up there. But it's gonna take that kind of look and that kind of activity to see things that that we've been watching for, for 5,000 years. Cleft lip and cleft palate and, and these other birth defects have been with us for a long time. So it's gonna take a very multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary approach to understand what's going on. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have time for a couple of questions. Gary, I have a question. Uh, barring a limitation on resources, uh, what area do you feel is most ripe for investigation in th this nature of these kind of gene environment interactions with preterm birth? And Immunology. Birth? Immunology for preterm birth, no doubt about it. Um, take a look at the short piece that David Stevenson and, and others have written, Matt Wallenstein in JAMA Peds. We think it's chronic inflammation. Uh, for birth defects, uh, there are certain birth defects that I absolutely think uh, we need to do a lot more work on nutrition. Uh, folic acid is a good story, but it's not a final story by any means. And birth defects like gastroschisis, I think we need to get, um, we need to get creative. I think it's a sexually transmitted infection. So I'm going to just put that out Very there. Intriguing. So <laughs> Very intriguing. Very <laughs> intriguing. So the question is, we're, we're looking at obese women and their inflammatory markers vis-a-vis -vis preterm and term. And have we looked into sort of normal weight women or even underweight women? I guess I'm putting that, I'm putting that additional piece into your question. The answer is not yet. We are about to. It's coming. So I, I, I don't know the answer to that yet. But it's an active area that we are very interested in. Thank you so much. Thank you all.